Welcome to another in our uh, podcast series. Usually we call these conversations with sound artists, but perhaps we should call this one conversations with artists about sound. <laughs> um, this is a co-production of the Dolby Institute and the Soundworks Collection. Um, and I'm really excited about the conversation that we're having today. We're at, we're at Dolby World Headquarters in San Francisco. And we are here to talk about an amazing uh, art installation uh, that is uh, is currently downstairs uh, from uh, the artist Sophie Clements, uh, working in collaboration with Joe Wills, who are our two guests on the show today. And I'm excited to uh, welcome to the table as well uh, my esteemed colleague from Dolby, uh, Kevin Bird, who is the director of experiential curation and visual identity at Dolby. Is that yeah. roughly right? I, it's a long title, um, but it's great to be here. I'm <laughs> super excited. To see that. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I, I, this is going to be a fun conversation for me because, I, you know, I come from the the, the world of sound for cinema, um, and what you guys are doing here on site is just really uh, mind blowingly amazing to me. But first, I thought, Kevin, could you sort of describe? The gallery space that's downstairs, and sort of what the, you know, what yeah. that space is like, and and how Sophie and Joe have come to be here, and and, and a little bit about this piece. Yeah, well, I mean, as many of you, uh, you know, your listeners probably know, Dolby is about advancing the science of sight and sound to make spectacular experiences. We're about enabling artists, whether you're a musician, a, a sound designer, director, etc. Um, we're really about sort of pushing that forward. And Dolby Gallery is uh, really a way for us to celebrate uh, technological advancements from a cultural perspective. So uh, the space is located in our headquarters on 1275 Market Street. Um, it's on the ground floor. Um, the different aspects to it, which are pretty amazing, uh, is this incredible, um, we call it the ribbon display, but it's a long four foot by 60 foot uh, LED uh, screen. And uh, that's accompanied by uh, Dolby Atmos uh, in, in the lobby space. So we can really take advantage of um, spatial audio in there. Um, so we've been hosting uh, a number of artists, both in the Bay Area and internationally with, you know, Sophie and Joe being here, um, uh, artists that are working in video and sound. So um, we're, uh, we, you know, we have a new exhibit every, you know, six to eight weeks. And uh, the latest piece um, in the space is by Sophie and Joe, um, uh, which uh, I'm excited for us to be talking about today. How did you find Sophie? Uh, good question. You know how these things work. I mean, it's... You guys it's, are being very silent over yeah. there. I've asked the question. I don't know how they, fa- how how, they find how me. I'm intrigued. I, yeah. I'm like super lucky. Um, you, you know, we stalked her for about 12 months on <laughs> yeah. Facebook and Instagram <laughs> and um, eventually <clears throat> got the courage to speak with her. I think... Um, We've, you know, we're always kind of looking out there, you know, the greatest thing about the World Wide Web right now is that you can experience um, artist work, uh, maybe not in their full glory, but at least get an an idea of the aspects that they're interested in. And we were kind of very interested in the way that you were sort of approaching uh, sound and, you know, being sort of central to the visual image and particularly your collaborations, I think, with um, musicians. And um, and that seemed to hit a nice um, connection back to this th- theme of cinematic magic. So celebrating um, Foley techniques and the history of sound. And it seemed to just fit quite comfortably. And then I, I came over to your studio, uh, I guess it was before Christmas of this. Yeah. Which this is year. where? In London. Okay. And uh, had a chat with you, and just um, it was more about um, understanding, you know, what she was kind of thinking of uh, the space and how she could sort of bring her art to it and take full advantage of um, the technology. The so this all came together pretty quickly. Super quick. So yeah. Sophie, I, I think you know, obviously, <clears throat> you know, our podcast audiences tended to be film students and aficionados for right. for sound uh, and film and and television and games yeah. 
Um, and obviously you have a very different uh, approach. Can you, so first of all, can you just describe a little bit about what, you know, what your art is and then specifically this piece, which is uh, called uh, Attempting to Delay the Inevitable. Yeah. Um, maybe the best way is for you to just describe a little bit about what this particular piece is downstairs. Sure. Um, so somebody coming into the gallery is going to see, um, I suppose you'd call it a series of cinematic time sculptures. Um, they're sort of repeated along the ribbon, um, and I suppose alluding to the idea of a film strip. Um, so what you actually see is three different elements or three different materials, um, smoke, water and glass. And all those materials are sort of suspended mid-air, mid-action. Um, and it's using bullet time, time slice photography. Time slice, I think that's the word, yeah. <laughs> So you basically got a camera moving around this one moment in time um, with the three different materials, one after the other. So they're kind of very beautiful, seductive things. And the, in terms of the title, Attempting to Delay the Inevitable, it's, it's, kind of, it's, it's about this idea of trying to hold on to a moment of change. So it's a slightly kind of philosophical idea, I suppose, that a lot of my work is concerned with. Um, yeah trying to sort of stop change if you we all look back in moments of our life that we think were perfect or you know this eternal dilemma of man I suppose of wanting to hold on to the moment so that's what kind of is behind the title but I mean visually when you see the work it, you're essentially seeing these really beautiful objects which I call like time sculptures I suppose um, and you walk in and you'll hear the the sound of these objects that Joe and I have created um, using the sound system, which is in, which is really really incredible mm. thing to be able to use. Um, yeah. And so, Joe, what, what, what's uh, can you describe? Uh, you know what your role in the process was, and and, and how you uh, collaborated sure. with Sophie. Yeah. So I, um, I've worked with Sophie on like a number of different projects over the years, and it's all, like I feel like we have quite a shared aesthetic and, and I think there's a bunch of things that we've always been really into it's very easy for us to share about that so when Sophie asked me to work on this it's like really exciting because it's like a it felt like we were it's like basically Dolby gave us the the toys that we've been <laughs> like <laughs> hankering after so we've done yeah. but always a lot of the stuff that we do and like a lot of my work has been in 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 sort of working in surround and but never with that many speakers like we've got like 30, 32 speakers and 16 subs that's just like toys so, for me. But when you're not working with Sophie, what are you doing? Uh, I'm a composer and sound designer, and okay. um, I run a record label in the in the UK that does sort of electronic inspired music, but also work on um, everything from kind of commercial stuff through to different art projects. And yeah. So Sophie, I guess you know one of the just to take a step back, just a really basic question mm. for you. You know, these pieces obviously <clears throat> are highly visual. Um, and and there's a great there's a great visual component to, to mm -hmm. what you're doing and, and it's you know there's a great behind the scenes piece um, that's playing downstairs as <laughs> yeah. well which I, I know we're going to post on uh, Dolby's Vimeo page yeah. so if you're curious about to take a look at what we're talking about um, you should definitely check that out but from just a very basic standpoint I guess my question for you is why is sound important to these pieces I make um, time-based work because I was interested in sound. Sound's central to everything that I do. Um, it's the reason that I work in film. Um, so, in a way, it's, it's a kind of a question that I don't even think about because I'm very much sound-led in everything that I do. Sound is massively important to these pieces, um, as it is to all of my work, because I suppose everything that I do is about refining and honing the marriage between sound and visual. Mm -hmm. um, so one can't exist without the other. I don't ever make visuals without knowing that they will have sound with them. So the process of putting sound to visuals, which is the direction that this happened this way, but obviously I do work in the other way as well. I spend a lot of time putting images to music. But in, in this context, for example, where we're putting sound to the visuals, it, it's the moment where they come alive then they don't exist as actual objects until they have both sides of their kind of character, I mm -hmm. suppose. 
It was really great conversation. I feel like those were really lovely conversations for us to have, like trying to, I guess for me to try try and understand what was in Sophie's mind about like what, what, how she felt the the things were and like, you know, kind of, I guess I have my own opinion about it, but then like getting to the point where we actually managed to realize these, um, these objects that like they feel so real and so tactile somehow, but they obviously don't exist in the real world physical world you know so i'm trying to figure out what that sound is and how what the kind of um i guess like the emotive qualities of it and stuff are that's has been a really interesting journey for us yeah. i think i love those conversations you know the genesis of a lot of the uh sound and the work uh, was uh happened while you were doing the visual which yeah. i found to be really unique so yeah. you're recording sound in the yeah. same space so there's um um maybe you guys maybe you can talk a little bit about that yeah. like process and you know this behind the scenes yeah and i think it would, it would, it would, it would we should probably just take a moment and and describe a little bit about so you you shot with a a, a ring a, a 360 ring of cameras yeah and so the idea behind <clears throat> and there's a great playfulness to this i mean even mm-hmm. just beginning with the you know the title attempting to delay the inevitable mm-hmm. um and then I found it hilarious that you know two of your three elements are smoke and mirrors, which we would that tend to. That was on purpose, by <laughs> the way. Right. Yeah, that was totally intentional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe I could just explain a little bit of Please, the um, yeah. thinking behind that. Um, it's also just really lucky that these are materials that I'm really interested in working with. But you know, given the given the cinema magic theme, I was thinking, well, what does what's the magic of cinema for me in in relation to my work? Um, and of course, it's illusion, right? I mean, we 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 set up a series of like multiple illusions, whether that's acting or believing in an actor or performance, or whether that's creating a set, or whether that's um, manipulating time. Like we're we're constantly setting up series of illusions to make somebody believe something, right? Um, and so then I was thinking, well, you know, what's what's another way of talking about illusion and magical illusion? Well, mm-hmm. smoke and mirrors, right? Mm-hmm. right. And I, I straight away was like, ah, there's my little hook. Yeah. You know, that, um, because that's basically what I'm doing in my work anyway. I'm super, super interested in that idea of the illusion of reality and, that, and I, you know, creating objects using our tools that we have with the moving image, right? Which essentially is being able to manipulate time. You deconstruct it and put it back together in a slightly different way and then bang, you've got a sculpture. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's kind of why I found a real link to the, to the, um, to the brief or the the subject of this piece, which was through the idea of smoke and mirrors. Right, right. Uh, It just, it became very whimsical. Yeah. Uh, which I love, but it's one thing I wanted to ask you about, and and I'm sure that's you know part of the, your conversations as you were exploring the idea. For me, there's very different information that's coming to you visually as opposed to from the sound. Um, and can you talk about you know what's what's the emotional state that you're trying to elicit in the audience, and how are you using image and sound separately to get at at that goal yeah i mean it's it's something that is massive thing that we think about throughout the project um the emotional state really that i'm looking for in the audience is a kind of wonder and awe and that kind of seduction towards this impossible thing that you're kind of looking at and experiencing um i think there's something very universal about um, that kind of awe that you can get when you're looking at natural phenomena and simple things reacting in um, uh, interesting ways because of light and you know wind and all sorts of stuff so in terms of when you put the sound to something it's it's really really key you have to be keep we have to keep thinking about that what's the feeling that we're trying to get across and so that's why it's like you work on multiple levels I think when I came into the sound design you know I was definitely thinking that it would be non-tonal that we would kind of really work with the fragility of 
the images um, and I was interested in um, changing the weight of, and scale of the objects with sound mm -hmm. um, because you don't actually know how big those puffs of smoke are and also they look so um, solid mm -hmm. but hollow right. and there's these really <clears throat> interesting conversations that we're having because I'm saying well you know I want that smoke to feel like if you were to pick it up and drop it on the floor it would shatter into lots of pieces yeah you know uh -huh. but and so that's kind of what we came in i came into it with joe wanting that kind of thing but then quite soon we realized actually how do you make those sounds how do you assign those sounds to something that isn't actually rubbing against anything it's not actually touching anything actually it's just moving and the thing that's sort of floating and moving doesn't really make any noise unless it right touches something else so then that that element of trying to give that feeling to the um, the objects was only we were only really able to um, give it that kind of hollow sound, or I suppose on the edits between one object and another object. Oh, interesting! Right. So we we started to then think about like what's the voice mm -hmm. of the object, you know, and so we started going off in a slightly different direction, didn't we? Of okay. going like. What's the feeling more than what's the actual physical sound? Because it's not. You're talking about the anything. voice, like kind of in, in almost like an anthropomorphic sense of like. Yeah, voice. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, we kept yeah. talking about the it's, soul of the object, yeah. right? I don't ever think about it like anthropomorph anthropomorphically, but it more kind of I don't know, philosophically or sure. whatever. I don't know. That's not even the right word either. But yeah, it, it's like how do you work on all these levels to to basically construct a sort of feeling. For the audience or an experience for the, for the audience so there's certain points where we like this is definitely more dreamlike right so let's be more full and more um tonal i suppose yeah, yeah, yeah. and then you know and that was the night time in the, the the first images of the smoke that you get in this in the night time and then there's all these conversations well about scale like okay it's more dreamy and so it should be more rumbly and then mm -hmm. as the camera gets closer well then maybe it feels like we're in an airplane going through <laughs> yeah. like a dream cloud. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. then we need wind because actually, so we start going off in different directions as we start working through yeah. it. But it's that just careful well, balancing. There's there's a lot of interesting things to me in, in what you just said. So in terms of the palette of sounds mm -hmm. that are on these objects, I'd love, Joe, for you to tell sort of like, what are the components of those pieces? Because one of the things that I found deeply intriguing about it is not knowing what you actually use to create the sounds. <laughs> As a viewer, it seems like there there's a there's a relationship mm -hmm. between you know each one of the objects and the sounds that you're mm -hmm. using to describe them. So you know, wind for the cloud, I can buy that. That's sort of like that. There's an association for me there. Yeah. They're both mm -hmm. sort of atmospheric kind of things, mm -hmm. um, but there's definitely the relationship between the image and sound is not literal in mm -hmm. any, no, in no, any no, sense. No, no. So what were some of the components that you used to, to generate? There's, there's a lot. It's yes, yeah, um, many, many different things. Uh, so uh, as Kevin was kind of saying earlier on, there's a bunch of stuff that came from the the shoot. Um, so there is the, you know, the actual sound of like the, the fuse that's attached to the bomb, that kind of features. There's points in it where you hear that like very literally. It's the, it's the start it's of the, the smoke beginning. section, but there's also, it's kind of throughout there's these like amazing little fizzy crackling sounds that came off it and they and they could be in any one of the three pieces um there's definitely very clearly like the sounds of like you know water being thrown around and glass being thrown around um there's sounds of sophie wandering around on piles of broken glass <laughs> with shoes on <laughs> i should say yeah um but then in addition to that you know like say the smoke um we were really like looking at the kind of history of Foley as well when we were getting into doing all the sound design for this project. So we we also did some these like amazing like really really tiny, very um, super quiet recordings of um, there's like a ceramic wasn't ceramic it? thing. Yes, yeah, so there's like a, a broken mug, um, and it's just running your finger really really slowly around the the, the broken edge of this mug, and then that's actually kind of the core. 
That's during the glass piece. No, that's glass the smoke. that's the smoke. That's during the smoke piece. So when you hear there's this there's these sort of notes that come in. Yeah, that's from the that's from this broken mug. And there's also there's a point in um, in the water piece where you're hearing like a again same thing but on a whetstone, just sort of put you know pulling your fingers over a whetstone. Mm-hmm. And it, it was really interesting. I mean, we're obviously recording it. It's very very high gain recording. And so you can really hear the difference between like one finger or two fingers or like dragging mm. your whole hand over it or using like the tip of your finger or the pad of your finger. Um, that one's amazing because they, all these things have tones to them. And that's mm. what's become the the sort of musical, in inverted commas, yeah. part of the composition. There are all these tones that have come from the materials that we've been working with. Um, and, and and then obviously with, with all the, a lot of the water is uh, glasses, is wine glasses, sort right. of pitched around and... Um, but I, and I think there's something that's been really, really sort of wonderful thing about the how it's worked out musically is like um, none of the ob- obviously all of the objects that we've been talking about there's like like tuning in, in music it could be quite a uh, could make you think about sort of tonality and stuff in a very sort of um, kind of conventional way I guess like you know what is a chord. When we're working with these these the, our, our um, sound sources as like you know non-specific things that have pitches, so we're bringing the pitches coming from physical objects, and then we're kind of compiling those things together, and that's defining our, our kind of harmonic palette. Um, so there is like as Sophie's saying, like as we you know we started off from this like very very um, pure. What does that object sound like? And on the quest to do that, we found all this kind of tonality and more sort of musical elements yeah. that have come through. And that's then led to uh, this sort of three movement composition, you know, like, mm-hmm. and actually there's a, each each movement has the same sort of arc of the, like the introduction of these tones that then move away to a, a, a space, which ties in with as the shots move to a kind of daylight. And then the, mm-hmm. the then a kind of stronger uh, return to the sort of tonal material towards the end of each movement and and how where those tones came from is a little bit different in each one and the, the so the, the so yeah that we have the there's this sort of ceramic thing in in smoke there's glass it for water and then the glass is actually glass for once <laughs> <laughs> but that's from it's like taking tiny tiny bits of the the, the tinkling like sounds the from sounds yeah, yeah, yeah 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 so we um, we've like just looping these tiny tiny mm. um it's like micro sampling really of of um yeah of of uh so basically pouring out very slowly pouring out a bucket of smashed glass and mirrors and then just catching one of those little tinkles and kind of making it into a tone that resonates throughout all of it mm-hmm. so many layers and we've always tried to, we've tried to approach each when we've thought about how the layers of the sound work there's always space and the space has always come actually from the warehouse that we did the the video shoot in i mean the the i don't know is it a video shoot what do you call film it shoot. film shoot whatever <laughs> Even though it's not in fact film, it's yeah, not in exactly. fact film. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> the many, many, many photos shoot. Yeah, so this, exactly. that's so, just, so why is it important to you to record the sounds in the same space that the image is recorded? Um, I think that there is a a there's a, a an aesthetic and a quality that pervades both. You know, and you, you can kind of see that in the. You can. I feel the space when I see the image. I can. I'm. 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 I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I'm imagining myself in some imagined space with it. And it's not to say that, that like we've exactly sorry no, <laughs> we've exactly sort of bought in that warehouse and you have to imagine that it's in that warehouse. I don't think that is the space that I'm imagining experiencing those objects in, but it is part of the of the visual quality and as such is part of the sound quality as well. I think there's also an element of purity of process. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, I think w- with most of my works, I would tend to try and make the sound from the sound of the actual objects. Um, Rather than recreating it after the fact? Yeah. Uh-huh. And what I would usually end up doing is sort of augmenting it with sure. things. Um, but the core of the sound that you're hearing coming from those objects. Um, and uh, yeah, for me, it's a sort of purity thing. You know, that mm-hmm. they, they actually, the whole point, you know, for example, visually, of course, all these things that you're looking at could be made in 3D, they could be, um, you know, synthesized made in, images. Synthesized images. Right. Um, so for me, it's extremely important that they are not, right. and they were filmed. You know, they actually really did exist for a real moment in time, and now we're just looking at it in a different time frame. And for the same kind of reasons that that 
the sound did actually originate from those mm -hmm. physical actions that right. happened. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of. I, I mean, I would say that you know, as I'm experiencing it both visually and sonically, one of the things that I take away is the um, maybe the imperfection mm -hmm. of. Uh, of, of the experience yeah. and um, where uh, so much of maybe what happens in film is about sort of achieving perfection. Mm. Uh -huh. uh, there's these hints that are um, visually uh, part of each piece that either show context or, you know, a, yeah. a, a, a bit of a, um, um, you know, the, uh, of the stand, uh, 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 the stand. Yeah. ringing, yeah. right? So yeah, it's yeah, almost exactly. or you see yeah. like a little string yeah. here yeah. Yeah. and uh, there's something to that that um it gives me a it, it grounds me in a very specific place and mm -hmm. i would argue that sonically maybe that's mm -hmm. like you know that i think it is a purity of process but there's these hints that um, mm -hmm. um both or you know sonically and visually that i, I find pretty that's compelling. really yeah that's really it's, interesting because it would it, you know it, you could easily have gone in in, in, in you know in image manipulation and, and taken out those bits of the rig sure. and made it into a much more sort of ethereal yeah. non they're, yeah, yeah they're they're absolutely intentional um, and in past pieces I've even if you've got a camera circling around an object that has been constructed in a similar kind of way I've quite often put things in between the camera and the object so that you pass you know mm -hmm. behind a ladder and so you see the object through the ladder you know that um realness is really really important and the imperfections are completely part mm -hmm. of that um and they have to be there and it's also it's not about creating an object um just to look at the object itself mm -hmm. you know for example that's why i've shot them in daylight as well as in a sort of more lit kind of dark studio kind of situation um because it's all it's all kind of about this these absolutely beautiful things existing in a really ordinary kind of space it's not supposed to be a studio shot like da -da, you know like right these are not that, glamour shots yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. so it's, it's about that friction yeah of of reality and i think that's that's what makes them especially seductive mm -hmm. because in a way we're used to seeing these kind of like slow-mo or bullet time shots and we've seen it in advertising we've seen it in hollywood movies or whatever whatever you know it's not a new language but the fact that that they're imperfect kind of for me it makes me want to reach out and touch them more then they're more accessible to me right um, that there's sort of less veiled between behind this sort of perfect sort of screen it's a more real thing that's really intentional mm -hmm. basically well, I, I, I want I, I want to follow up on that line mm -hmm. of thinking. Some of the other pieces that you have on your on your website, mm. um, one of the things that so one of the things that I think is true about the piece that's downstairs right now here at Dolby is um, it looks fantastic and it sounds amazing, you know, because of the sound design and also because of the Atmos yeah, yeah. presentation, which, yeah. Helps, yeah. which we'll talk <laughs> which we'll talk about in a minute. But <clears throat> one of the things that that um, I, I was deeply intrigued by. Um, some of the pieces on your on your website, um, and I'm thinking about uh, like pieces like bicycle samba, yeah, which I'm sure is some <laughs> you know something that, that people point to. You there, there's um, you have a tendency sometimes to to uh, combine really pristine sound mm -hmm. with very lo-fi images, yeah. Um, and I wondered if you could speak to that a little bit. Um, because like bicycle samba, I feel like I felt like it was it was shot off of a off of a monitor. Like yeah, you purposefully times. degraded the image <clears throat> yeah. several times. Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe bicycle samba is a difficult example because it's really fun. <laughs> um, I think that maybe there's a couple of things in play. I, I mean, firstly, which isn't a really a proper answer, but you know, I, when I made those pieces, I was studying and I was studying at a time where you know we were using standard definition digital cameras mm -hmm. right and at the time I was really having a problem with digital footage as opposed to sound in terms of how how you affect a viewer 
You're talking about sort of emotionally how digital exactly. affects them differently than yeah film. Because maybe? because you know like okay, I, so I'm not a proper proper sound designer, so I, I'm sure lots of sound designer, designers would hear me talk about this and sort of pull me up on it. But my feeling about sound is that it's such an open medium. You know, you it's it, you, you process it in a very different way to how you process visual material and. I found it extremely open as a medium to work with and you know I could work conceptually with sound very easily and I think create things for me that were powerful and very interesting quite easily um whereas digital footage I had I was having a kind of a problem with it in that and this is this kind of digital footage that was like when I was studying mm -hmm. it, it was very flat um and it tells a lot of information but not in a very nice way <laughs> basically yeah, yeah um and i just there was something too ordinary about it so i mean actually the bicycle samba piece it was done we had this amazing series of projects where we had to make a film every week for seven weeks which was super hard but <laughs> i was working with um super eight film a lot at that right. time because of my kind of problem with that flat like not very good digital footage look mm -hmm. and i was really really into working with film because it somehow puts this lens in between the viewer and the object the viewer and the thing that's being filmed and it becomes more emotional more poetic um so I, I suppose i was trying to make work that was removed from like visual reality so that somehow it would end up being able to affect the viewer in a similar way to how sound was which was more emotional mm -hmm. like you know if i was to work with film i felt that you might be able to look at that image and that not know when that image was made that image might have been made 20 years ago 30 years ago or it might have been a dream that you had mm -hmm. and i often say this as an example to my students you know like my thing about film and I guess the a degraded image is like you know you film a chair and you film it with like super high res digital footage and I guess I'm <laughs> you know not maybe with this beautiful stuff that you can film with now but and it will be that chair in that time in that space right you film it with film and it's like a chair from history or a chair that you dreamt about last night you know there's there's an ambiguity because the high resolution is a signal to the viewer about time frame it it tells a lot interesting right but but i will also add here that i'm not really talking about what's available to us now right i think i'm really that that view really holds for me um with that kind of standard definition like amateur video sure. dv cam yeah. kind of thing which is very it was flat so crisp. and yeah. it's really mm -hmm. crisp and flat and you know just there's no magic in it for yeah. me. But the current imaging technology uh, feels very different to you, obviously. Sure, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, even just DSLRs, you know, the fact that you can put beautiful lenses on there and create beautiful images. I mean, I still absolutely love working with film and I will work with film whenever I, whenever I can, but there's certain pieces of work that I make where registration, like, you know, multiple cameras and registration things you know you just can't for i can't let's have a huge budget yeah i can't work with film so it's, yeah of course it's it, it's different now but that's in relation to those earlier works on my website it was about trying to degrade the image to enable there to be more of an ambiguity yeah. of what you're seeing so i'm i'm curious about um i'm not sure exactly how to phrase this but you so the piece here obviously is is it's site specific it's it's meant to be um experienced here in this gallery mm -hmm. what for you is the relationship between that kind of work as opposed to making more strictly video-based work f to be experienced like through vimeo or you know th on the web um do you do do you do both do you feel like more richly drawn to another or how do you decide kind of where things should live I guess I mean I don't think I would ever really make work to be seen on the web mm -hmm. I you know I would imagine that people would see work that they, they would 
use the Vimeo or, or the web as a sort of door into my work mm -hmm. um, and like collaborative stuff that I'm doing rather than being made specifically for that. So I would always imagine to try and show work in, in places like this or situations like this, sure. you know, la la large scale. Um, and then understand how maybe pieces like that can be shown in other kinds of spaces. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I think what you're getting at is a lot of um, the audience to uh, this podcast are yeah. about sound design, where ultimately you're viewing something maybe in a theater where sure, it's yeah, very yeah. calibrated, yeah. right? Um, a lot of the spaces that you work in is mm. not necessarily in a theater. And mm. uh, I think that's kind of... Um, maybe at the heart of like how does that begin to affect the way you're thinking about your work mm -hmm. yeah i mean we actually spoke about that a little bit earlier today in terms of you know this piece i think you've got to understand what variables sorry what variables you'd be working with mm -hmm. and what best configuration of um sound and image projection or screens or speakers you know how you make the work work best in a particular mm -hmm. situation um i think both of us you know in terms of um video with sound most of the time it would probably be either in a gallery for me or for a live performance right. situation so we're always talking relatively large large scale you know i might have my work on monitors or i might have them like here or i might have them as a series of projections or or we might be doing a live performance where there'll be a big projection and and live performance, yeah. you know. But it's always in that kind of context and you always just think, okay, how do we get the best out of this situation? Mm -hmm. Do you know what those contexts are going to be before or as you're making uh, uh, the piece? Because I can, I can imagine, you know, I mean, my experiences with video installations and in, in galleries tends to be a little frustrating because you know acoustically <laughs> these are not yeah 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 these are not great spaces and yeah. often visually not either you've got you know, you know light bleeding from other places you mm -hmm. know it, I, I find that experience right 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 <laughs> so how do you how do you optimize for that experience you make the work as best as you can you make it you know absolutely as good as you possibly can on in your you know computer and headphones and then you go there and fight the fight <laughs> you know, right, no, I yeah. mean that in a silly way, but also that you know, it's true. You know, you go there, you represent the the piece, and and you and you work with the people there to 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 make it like be shown in the best possible way. Right. But yes, it's it's always a bit of an issue. There's always you know how do we play it back? I mean, God, we're so lucky mm -hmm. here with the playback situation and sound system. It's like a dream turning up and not having any stress. We've had no stress no. at all. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, always, usually there's, you know, what projectors are you going to play it on? Yeah. What's your playback system? What the sounds? Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. fighting. No, we have to have bass in the speakers. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah, just, yeah. Uh, it's interesting because I, I like, um, you know, getting back to that imperfection, you know, every yeah. space is going to have that. And so how mm -hmm. do you embrace it? Like when I was watching the piece for one of the first times, I was like, wow, that really sounds like a, a bus coming around the corner. And uh, <laughs> it was a bus it coming around the corner. You know, so you're, you're, you're working maybe um, in a less pristine presentation. Yeah. Um, um, sure. But actually with that, one of the things that was great about the process here is that um, you know Dolby has the enough tech basically to be able to do this you know to be able to bring in ideas we obviously had to mix it here so in the studio here first but then actually having time with an open-ended session in the space so there's I remember when I arrived one of the first things <laughs> that John Luce said to me was like you know there's all these very very quiet textural sounds and he's like right we're gonna have to compress that loads because you won't hear it over the buses and stuff and my natural sort of response to that is like take your hands off my stuff you know like sure yeah. <laughs> um it's like that for a reason but he's totally right and obviously he has a better experience of the place than me and then we were actually but actually having the time and the, to work with the mix in the space yeah. and like bring up the things that were too loud bring down the th oh, no other way around bring down the things that were too loud and yeah. like bump the really textural stuff yeah 
see what works because obviously also like it's such a kind of crazy space for surround sound this sort of l-shaped room so to be able to play with the movement of sound within it and stuff to this really um really specific and intense detail has been a real like a really fantastic experience i think for both of us yeah. and i so often if i'm when working with artists going into galleries galleries are just not designed for sound and of course so yeah. like it's usually like step one the sound system is like some stupid thing for like communicating that there's been a like somebody's left their car it's a PA outside. system yeah like in the room yeah. <laughs> it's like this tinny thing and they're like yeah yeah put your like mix that you've spent weeks working on through that or they'll bring in sound and like there's nowhere to put the speakers because it gets in the way of the the like projections or like yeah, yeah, you know they, they, yeah. it has it, everything's booming all over the place there's like you can't run cables anywhere so the difference it's just such a different experience for us here because well, so it's set I, up let's take it. let's take a moment just to describe what acoustically is happening downstairs yeah so sure. so the the dimensions of the lobby space are basically the so the video the, the video ribbon is uh, how long is it 62 foot 64 60, uh, 60. i don't know exactly but around yeah. 60 feet yeah. and it wraps around a wall right so um what the audience is experiencing downstairs is a dolby atmos mix which in this context means three sets of overhead speakers so there are no mm -hmm. side there are no wall mounted speakers it's it's entirely coming from overhead mm -hmm. but the atmos comes in because each one of the speakers could be triggered individually yeah. mm -hmm. with a sound object yeah yeah mm -hmm. so you've got this you know kind of 60 foot long runway to yeah, work exactly. with. Exactly. Yeah. Acoustically yeah. that's also in three levels. Yeah. So moving back from the screen. So mm -hmm. it's highly directional and yeah. very mm -hmm. specific. And John Luce was telling me earlier this morning something like something like fifty some odd speakers and then yeah. something insane like thirty subwoofers. Thirty four yeah, yeah, yeah. subs. Thirty yeah. su thirty four subwoofers in this space. Which um I, I just I, on, on another thought when I was experiencing the piece you know the the way you've shot this which is basically these suspended objects and mm -hmm. then you're using the 360 cameras yeah. to move around them but they're frozen and suspended so there's a there's a there's a a great lightness about mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. but the sound introduces weight yeah in a really delightful yeah, way. yeah. way um so I'd love for you to talk uh, just a little bit about you know so you you did a certain amount of mixing and preparation mm -hmm. in England yeah before you came here and then you got here and worked with John Luce uh, who is uh, one of our great sound mixers here yeah. at Dolby to do an Atmos version of the mix yes. and also optimize it for the space so yeah. how how did what was that process like for you um, yeah great like it's it's uh, as I was saying before like I have quite a lot of experience working on um, different sort of custom made surround rigs but never anything like with it never with anything with the sort of technological control that the the, the atmos system gave us so i like i had i had um yeah i guess we had to figure out a way to to translate so we mixed it in quad in my studio um and you just had to it had to, a lot of it had to be imagination you know but knowing that there's we can make stuff come from off screen yeah um, knowing that there's the, the, I mean, that was our interpretation of the Atmos system was to kind of divide it into these three rows because that seemed like um, kind of the best way to use the length of the space. Mm -hmm. um, but then, so then there was a bunch of things that we put in, like obviously we were experimenting with panning things in London and then um, kind of got, that was really the only stumbling block. Uh, I was just like looking at Jürgen saying like thanks for sorting it out um, so I, I'd kind of you know I'd, we'd, we had we'd imagined it in in rows and really you know the Atmos system isn't really designed to necessarily think in rows in that way so there was a bit of a, a, a gap we had to bridge so all the panning and stuff that I'd put in was only really useful as a guide we kind of had to redo that to make it hit all the speakers that we wanted it to right um, and then so there was a lot of work on that and obviously kind of balancing and then like the like absolute joy of being able to like just yeah. pick up a sound and like whiz it wherever you want right like, just yeah. so. or also say i want it to come from right there yeah exactly it's like yeah. that speaker it's, to yeah. that speaker i mean it was sculpting yes basically. exactly i think that's exactly. a good word to use yeah we had broad ideas well quite specific ideas but you know we knew that there was no point in really trying to like make those happen in down. London so we just knew that those kind of ones wanted to move like that and those kind of ones were yeah. going to do certain things and 
we came here and sculpted it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And how many? How long did that process take? How? How? Here. Yeah. Uh, we did uh, two days. Um, and there are three. There are three. There are three chapters to the piece. Yes. Almost. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And so the, the total running time is what? Maybe fifteen minutes. Mm -hmm. Seventeen. Seventeen, 17 minutes. minutes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess. Yeah, we did two days. Two days mixing in the studio here, and then a yeah. day in the in the yeah. um, gallery. Um, and I don't know how much we did in addition to that in the UK, like a bunch. <laughs> well, I want There's um, one thing I wanted to ask you. Um, you know, there's a there's an amazing tonality and emotionalness to the to the the sound of the pieces. I, and you know, in the world that I come from there's a rigorous wall between the sound effects mm -hmm. department and the music department. Mm. They're separate groups of people. Often they don't communicate with each other, which is just mind boggling yeah, and yeah, stupid. Yeah. But that's a lot of the, that's a lot of the heartache and woe that happens on a final mix stage is because all these elements are finally coming together for the first time. Mm -hmm. And often they're competing for, mm -hmm. you know, for attention or, or each department has felt like they were responsible for, doing the same thing mm -hmm. but there's um you know there's a there's a uh, there's a much more seamless flow for these pieces mm -hmm. between what i would call sound effects mm -hmm. and foley versus music so how just describe well, the process to me and how do you decide like well that, what's going to be what yeah you know? well that's i think it's it's you know you're talking about that I've, I've met i've been on both sides of that um that dividing wall before and it's always seemed a funny one to me because like by the, the very existence of foley we are admitting that the sound that we see in the cinema is not real right so it, it is artistic step one it's an interpretation so that to then say like oh this is real and like that's not real is a very funny arbitrary leap for anyone to make like that. that's how it is so i feel like we have no, I, there is no point in that that I would say one thing is musical and one thing is sound effects. They are all of the same. Like it's a that there are there are physical things that have sound and they also have an emotional, uh, so, uh, so yeah, more kind of emotive connection to the observer or to like the maker, you know. So um, it has never yeah, it just there isn't there isn't a separation for me in that. I think it's all it's a very interesting question in terms of like the art world and the line between sound and music. I mean, of course there are exceptions, but I certainly felt, you know, years ago when I was finished, finished my MA and knew that I wanted to, I was working with sound and music. It's, you know, sound is way more sound. I mean, what is sound and what is music is a whole thing to be discussed anyway, <laughs> of course, but sound is kind of much more widely acceptable in the gallery context than a piece of video with music really it yeah it's why is that of, is it seen as manipulative or i don't really it depends how you use the music and of course there are masses of exceptions but i felt as a sort of somebody just coming into that world and sort of putting my foot in the art world a little bit that it just wasn't really the place to put music not in my kind of work, not in the kind of mm -hmm. work that I'm making. And so that's a kind of a half point, I suppose, because I kind of can back it up, but then not really. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's something I'm very aware of when I'm working with sound with my pieces, because it I want it to be evocative and I want it to be emotional, mm -hmm. but I don't want that. It, you have to rein it in, you have to, be on the right side of that because if you push that evocative emotional thing which I suppose comes more with the tonal musical thing it can become a soundtrack right and yeah, not yeah, yeah. the sound of the thing right so it has to be the embodiment and the reality of the object not that object soundtrack and yeah. I know that's a really fine distinction but no, it's no, really it is. really important well it's also you know by using like the objects like like mm -hmm. a glass to to you know you rub it and you get a tonality mm. you end up kind of sneakily getting to the same point yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. but in a way that's not obvious yeah. mm -hmm. and a way that doesn't signal to the audience mm. we're manipulating you through music yeah, yeah. <laughs> right yeah and that's what was so lovely about doing these things because 
what I, for example, I, I know that Joe has this sort of amazing breadth, or what's the word, breadth of, of sort of sensibilities or artistic sensibilities. I knew that we could wholly go down the purest sound design, kind of mm -hmm. everything comes from the space route, and we would have made something really great. And But I know that you also have a really, you know, like you, you make really delicate acoustic music at mm -hmm. the same time you make yeah. super bass heavy electronic music and I knew that there's a sort of massive sort of tonal world mm -hmm. that you could bring to it and I think when we started I was maybe not up for that but gradually going hmm, maybe we really need to like, bring some tones yeah, out yeah, and yeah. make some really beautiful moments and ended up that's really what this kind of iteration of these pieces really needed it mm. really needed the sound to help with the beginning and the end. So with every piece, it starts kind of with a realistic sound mm -hmm. and you finish with this really kind of luscious, more tonal musical sound. Mm -hmm. And that was, um, became really important. Um, yeah. But I really savor and love those those moments where you go, actually, let's, let's go there, <laughs> you know? Let's right. go to that beautiful tonal place that we didn't expect to get to, but you have to do it from a kind of purist sort of perspective, I suppose. Mm. Yeah. So that all the tones have come from the actual. Well, tone. it's interesting what you just said, because I find that 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 often ends up being the case, which is that you 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 start with a set of arbitrarily but so, but self-defined rules. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Like, and then you live in that world and then you decide to break them, but you yeah. do it, you do it mindfully. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's the, it, that's the all important part of that process, isn't it? You have right. to sort of define somehow so that you can actually make a, a clear decision about the thing that you've defined, you know, it's like, okay, I see that now. Let's yeah. do this. <laughs> I think I, I, there's something for me in the tonality of all, all of those bits. There's this sort of wonderful, um, that's one of the things that uh, my sort of happy points within watching the piece in, as it's installed here is like that you can kind of drift with the with the object in the space with mm -hmm. it, and it's like a, a um, yeah, it's, it, it, there is this sort of beauty and power and like all of these these other things that, are, that don't are not. I think they are in the in the in the perceived object, but we've sort of like really tried to bring them out with the sound so yeah, that you can let like let see. all this stuff wash over you and. And um and yeah, in, enjoy it. And that's uh, that's my yes, yeah, so that's my sort of happy point. Standing on the corner, <laughs> the corner is the place to check it out. You just yeah. let it all happen. <laughs> yep. Okay, well, we'll take you from your happy place to uh, uh, <laughs> to to, to a, qu a question. Not not to put you on the spot, but Sophie, you know, you um, you know, th th this combination of image and sound has been a uh, bedrock of, or I guess, a foundational principle of your yep. work. And you've worked with lots of different sound artist so what are you looking for in a collaborator how do you you know um well actually i haven't worked with lots and that i think that's the key uh -huh. i like to form long-standing close relationships with sound um collaborators because it's such an important part of my work and i have to be able to communicate clearly mm -hmm. um so really in terms of people that have worked on my like you know my sort of maybe more gallery work so which which I would set aside from my work with musicians where I'm working on their music mm -hmm. I, I think there's you know three or four people that I've worked with mm. um it's I well like I was saying before you know I I, I work with people whose aesthetic sensibilities I, I find a kind of a long mind that I think that they have something to bring that I wouldn't be able to bring and that uh, we have a clear um, method of communication. I mean, that's that's really the key. Mm -hmm. When we sit in the studio and do hand gestures and silly sounds, a lot, of, a lot like, of amazing noises. A lot noises. of sort of, <laughs> you know, you know this, you know, like trying to like talk about the spirit of this smoke thing. I mean, it's. Yeah. I've I've had situations where I, you know, try to explain these certain things to maybe one or two sound artists and and you know you think that you're completely on the same page and that you know right. like yeah we're yes we're so there we've cracked it you know and then you go off and then you come back and, you, and I'm like wow that is 
absolutely not what I was thinking at all. Yeah. Um, and sometimes that can be delightful. It can. But oftentimes. <laughs> sometimes it can't. But, um, but it might be so yeah. that that's one of the nice, that's one of the things that I've, I like about our working relationship actually is that when that does happen, I feel like, so actually we, we were talking a bit about this earlier on, like the very first versions of the sound that I made were much more epic. Like, I mean, it sounds, I know it sounds quite epic now. Maybe we found the middle ground or something, but it was mm -hmm. like really, it was like massive, really loud, huge sweeping things. And then it's like Sophie came in and was like, actually, like it's really loads more fragile for me. Mm. Um, and that's actually a really exciting moment for me. Like it, I was a bit like, oh, right, okay, like, like just put the brakes on with where my brain has gone completely and come back to find something else. And, and, and that's kind of, you know, and then we've gone down this other journey and there's maybe there are elements of that that have come back in. Mm. But that's why. Uh, collaborating with somebody that you can work well with is a wonderful thing because what comes out is something that neither one of us would have made by ourselves. Totally. Right. Uh, so it's this like third person that is a bit of both of our brains that yeah. can that has that idea, you know, and that's a, a wonderful process. And it's so important to me, you know, because that's what it, it's breathing life into the into the work. It's such an important part of the process that mm. choosing a a collaborator is just yeah so important. And obviously, I've work with Joe we've worked we've worked together for 10 years or so mm -hmm. I mean we've only done really sort of one and a half or two yeah, yeah, of yeah. our own yeah, projects yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> together and I'm sure we're going to do lots more in in the future but I knew that Joe would be absolutely perfect because I know his sensibilities from working with mm -hmm. him for such a long time I know that he has you know those spectrums of like abilities and sensibilities and mm. Um, from the like, like I said, the heavy bass to the super <laughs> sensitive, beautiful ac acoustic stuff. You know? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what are I mean, I'm curious for the both of you? Like, are you? What are other media that you're interested in exploring? Like, does VR is VR an interesting thing for you? Just becoming mm -hmm. one, I think. And it's it's funny how sort of quickly it's become kind, it's of, kind of on exploding my radar. right now yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah i have a very very good friend who actually made the bicycle samba piece with me mm -hmm. years ago a guy called john who now lives in la and i think he's even partnered with dolby and um doing some stuff for vr with with dolby but um he phoned me up oh with the john piece yeah. oh it's interesting yeah i just came back from sundance where we premiered to a piece so, from john and a piece from uh uh, Spectre Theory uh, okay. in Atmos with okay. for VR, yeah. But um, sounds great. Yeah, I mean, he <laughs> he just phoned me up, you know, a couple of months ago and said, "Hey, you know, I'm doing this three-dimensional um, sound for v VR. It's super super interesting. Would you ever consider doing something experimental?" And I also have an, a sculptor friend who, f actually, for years has has he's stopped making real sculptures and he's just working in VR sculptures. I think f um, it never really interested me while it was um, computer graphics. Right. And now that there's these camera rigs and you can actually film stuff. Real things. Real things, yeah. real time. That's where I'm starting to think, oh, well, and you know, if, if maybe it's worth having a serious thought about, it's quite exciting. I mean, I, I'm more interested in the three-dimensional sound yeah. thing mm -hmm. than I am the three-dimensional put a headset on visual mm -hmm. thing but um that's quite often the way way around that i get interested right in the sound first and then the visual after oh that's interesting but yeah i mean it's it's giving the opportunity to experience things that you can't experience in your normal situation or time frame or whatever so yeah certainly potentially an interesting avenue yeah. to explore great I think that I've, I've exhausted my list of questions. Do you have any any uh, anything we should add, Kevin? Um, you both have been to San Francisco before. Um, <laughs> what any any new experiences here that uh, I mean, other than the um, amazing flying speaker rig and like massive sparkly screen? I think we covered that. <laughs> yeah, I think we covered yeah. that. Well, we were talking about fried food before we. Were yeah, there. yeah, yeah. Has some very very good very fried food last night. <laughs> Um, a I lot of food last September. So yeah, it wasn't that long ago. For you. Still... Had a yeah. lot of pancakes. Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> I feel I like we have to get it in while we're here. You know, we've had pancakes most mornings, and we're feeling a bit ashamed about it. <laughs> you, you make it sound like there are no pancakes in England. 
There are pancakes like in England, but it's not the same like the pancakes, syrup, bacon, syrup, syrup, butter, like <laughs> smash. Bam. Yeah. It's a good thing. It's a very good thing, that. And I, I've been like waking up in the morning because obviously we've had this old jet lag situation. So you don't know when either of us is going to wake yeah. up and we're staying in different houses. And you get this little text like 6.30. It's like, um, pancakes. Pan- pancakes? What? <laughs> <laughs> See you in the pancake place. <laughs> All right. Well, now that this has gone completely off the rails, uh, <laughs> sorry about that. that. No, no, that's great. That's take responsibility. Yeah, that's 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 perfectly good. Um, well, I'm excited about tonight. So yeah, uh, yeah. definitely, we're having uh, an opening reception and a celebration. So we're going to watch some short films and uh, a good crowd to come and experience mm-hmm. your work. So, um, and you know, uh, there's more to learn about this stuff. Uh, there'll be a piece uh, on Dolby.com about uh, about Sophie's work and the installation here. And of course, Sophie, you have a great website of your yeah, own, SophieClements.com. But there's some really great <laughs> stuff on there. Really interesting stuff. Um, so I, I just wanted to uh, thank you guys again for participating, Sophie, Joe, Kevin. Thank you for joining me on this little adventure. Of course. <laughs> and can, um, I, can I just? say a huge huge thank you to Dolby and everyone it's just been an incredible yeah. experience and an amazing opportunity to be pushed to make this piece of work and to be able to come here and, and work with your your rig yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible so yeah it's priceless you know being pushed to make a new piece of work is absolutely priceless for me as an artist it wouldn't exist if you hadn't asked so thank well, you this is something that Kevin and I have talked about before one of the things that's really exciting is you know we, we you know we create these technologies, but then the really fun part is you put them in the hands of artists and just see where they're yeah. going to go with them. Yeah. And that's when, you know, it gets to be really delightful. So um, thanks again for joining us. This is uh, our regular podcast series from the Dolby Institute and the Soundworks Collection. And uh, we'll talk to you next time. Mm-hmm.